If ever there was a weapon that symbolized the term people's revolution, it would be an AK-47. And the man holding that weapon would be riding atop a T-54. The T-54 enjoyed the longest production run of any tank in history. Estimated production numbers for the series range from 96,000 to over 100,000 units. The system has been in continuous service for the last 75 years, under the flag of 50 different armies, and has seen action in 42 conflicts throughout the world. The vehicle has even outlasted the nation that birthed it. It is truly the bastion of the Soviet Union. But before the T-54 was ever built, its design team was nearly killed. At the outset of World War II, Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany had an alliance of mutual suspicion. And these suspicions would prove well-founded at the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of Russia in 1941. In the first few months of the war, Soviet mechanized troops suffered heavy losses in armored vehicles. But as long as new tanks arrived at the front from the factories, the losses could be replenished. Due to the rapid advance of German troops in country, by August, there was a direct threat to the main centers of tank production. The order was given by the Russian Central Committee to evacuate more than 16 million civilians from the Western Front, including the entire operations of some 1,500 factories. The Nizhny Tagil Design Bureau, who designed the T-34 just a year earlier, was led by Alexander Morozov. Their factory was the center of Soviet tank production. Situated in vulnerable Kharkiv, just miles from the front line, it was a frequent target for air raids. When orders came down to evacuate, their destination was far away in the Ural Mountains. The engineers, accustomed to the metropolitan lifestyle of Kharkiv, begrudgingly followed the directive. Only 45 days later, the city would be overrun by Nazi troops. The first T-34 from the Ural factory was not ready until December of that year. But nearly 18 months later in 1943, the tide would turn in Russian favor at Stalingrad. By this time, the design bureau had already developed an improved T-34, but the tank designers were told to freeze their designs and concentrate on making the tanks easier and cheaper to manufacture. This doctrine of mass production would prove successful and later be extremely influential as it led to Soviet victory in a war for survival. By 1944, the designers were busy trying to replace the T-34. A T-34M was suggested, followed shortly by a T-43, both visually indiscernible from the T-34. Finally, the T-44 was selected as a tentative replacement for the T-34. However, it was clear that that too would be short-lived. Focus on sharing manufacturing components with the T-34 resulted in the T-44 having a very small turret ring. At just 1600 millimeters in diameter, this proved too small for any incremental improvements to be made to the vehicle. It forced the crew to sit too closely to the gun and have difficulty reaching down into the hull, reloading ammunition. The T-44 did not see action in the war, and by war's end in 1945, the idea to share components with the T-34 was finally abandoned, leading to the T-54's design in 1946. Funnily enough, the smallest improvement over the T-44 led to a tank that was so progressive that the Soviet army had no need to develop a replacement for over a decade. An increase of the turret ring diameter from 1600 millimeters to 1800 millimeters. First revealed in 1947, the T-54-1 showed a distinct reverse bevel at the base of the turret. This was a feature to allow the driver to open his hatch at all 360 degrees of turret rotation and to allow placement of dual SG-43 machine gun boxes on the left and right fender. 
the fender mounted machine guns were meant to eliminate the typical weak spot of a hole mounted machine gun. Each box contained 250 rounds of ammunition. A third SG-43 was placed coaxial, with 3,500 rounds stored, while the main 100mm D-10 cannon carried 34 rounds. A DSHK 12.7mm gun was placed outside the commander's hatch, meant for anti-aircraft fire. However, it seemed telling that doubts of its anti-aircraft use arose early, since only 150 rounds were included. The maximum depression angle for the main gun was negative 5 degrees, with the maximum elevation at 18 degrees. The power plant was a V54, four-stroke, liquid-cooled V12 diesel engine, putting 382 kilowatts, or 520 horsepower, to the drive sprocket. The engine could be started by delivering a shot of compressed air or using an electric starter. The transmission was a five-speed manual utilizing a dry friction clutch, extremely similar to modern-day road cars. Borrowing an improvement from the T-44, the T-54 was equipped with a 10RT-12 ultra shortwave radio with an intercom system for crew-to-crew -crew communication. While conducting live fire penetration testing, a glaring problem was soon discovered. The unique reverse bevel design allowed hits low on the turret to ricochet directly down onto the weakest part of the tank's armor, the roof, penetrating the crew compartment. Going back to the drawing board, designers returned in 1949 with a T-54 II. The reverse bevel was removed from the front of the turret and the mantlet size was decreased changing the gun depression angle from a maximum of negative 5 to 18 degrees to a maximum depression of negative 4 and a maximum elevation of 17 degrees. The new turret design required the removal of the dual fender-mounted machine guns. To improve off-road performance, the tracks were widened to 580 millimeters, up from the 500 millimeter track width of the T-34, 44, and T-54-1. The combat weight was reduced from 36 tons to 35.5 tons by reducing the ammunition load. Additional observation devices for the driver and tank commander were installed, and several technical improvements to the engine were made. The electric starter was removed, as it was found to drain the battery, leaving only the compressed air method. An oil heater to control engine temperature was installed, providing higher fuel efficiency. Oil bath pre-filters for the air intake were installed, common on heavy machinery used in dusty environments. However, the reverse bevels on the rear of the turret presented the same issue as before, negating all the other technical improvements, leading to the next and final model, the T-54-3, featuring the prototypical hemispherical turret. This third rendition, known internally as the 1951 model, included even more small improvements. An enlarged engine fan was introduced as the oil heater that increased fuel efficiency also caused overheating. The signature starboard side fender mounted extended fuel tank was introduced that would later also be used in the T-64 and T-72 models. Machine guns were upgraded from the SG-43 to the modernized SGMT variant, still chambered in 7.62x54. The 12.7mm ammunition for the DSHK was doubled to 500 rounds, and some of the observation devices added to the T-54-2 were removed as they were deemed redundant and replaced by night vision devices. Somewhat telling of the lost art of Soviet design in that era, even though the tank had been formally adopted by the army in 1952, the engineers continued to make improvements. The engine fan was replaced by a slightly smaller and more efficient version. The exhaust headers were completely redesigned as they were found to expand when the engine was idle for long periods, causing exhaust leaks and improved non-freezable rubber gaskets were added to all sections of the tank, finally waterproofing it. Though the most notable improvement was indeed asked for by the army, 
a gyroscopic gun stabilizer to replace the single plane vertical stabilizer. While developing the gyroscopic stabilizer in 1954, a disaster was narrowly avoided. One of the designers of the stabilizer, Mr. Lipkin, decided to test it by jumping on the gun barrel with the stabilizer enabled. At the same time, a scream emanated from the deputy chief of the factory, Mr. Avdiv. Mr. Avdiv was inside the tank and stuck his head between the breech of the gun barrel and the ceiling to ensure the stabilizer cylinder wasn't leaking. At the same time, Mr. Lipkin jumped on the gun. Serious consequences were only avoided since Lipkin was not a large man. After the tank was accepted in the service, the T-54 platform would go on to host 11 different variations. Most notably, the T-054 flamethrower, the SU-122-54 self-propelled gun, the ZSU-57-2 self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, the PT-54 mine roller, and six different engineering vehicles. The rarest option was the T-54K command tank, which was equipped with a 10 meter or 30 foot tall antenna and a miniature radio station at the rear of the turret. To power the radio, an additional 2.2 kilowatt or three horsepower engine was installed behind the driver's seat. The internal fuel tank size was reduced to allow room for a five man crew instead of four, the fifth member being a dedicated radio operator. By 1957, the T-54 had only been in production for two years and armies were already facing the very real possibility of having to advance on sites of recent nuclear blasts. A project to modernize the T-54 had begun and would become the colloquially similar T-55 tank. The system was originally intended to share the T-54 name as it shared most of its components. However, communist policies had their typical influence. At the time, Soviet law governing the economy required factories to reduce the cost of their products by 15% annually. Unless the factories regularly refreshed or renamed their products, they would quickly begin losing money. A new tank could have an increased price, meaning profit margins could remain stable for a few more years. While sharing the same chassis, gun, turret, and layout as the T-54, the T-55 had small improvements to nearly all aspects of the vehicle. Forged internals gave a 50 horsepower boost to 570 horsepower, or 426 kilowatts. The SGMT machine guns were replaced by the PKM. Improved road wheels and drive sprocket and adjustable seats throughout. The main discernible differences were a sealed engine compartment for submerged driving, a modified internal fuel tank, and a shockwave detection system. The shockwave detection system was in place to detect whether a nuclear blast had gone off within range of the tank. Sensing the extreme change in exterior air pressure, the system would automatically shut down the tank's engine, seal all possible exterior ports, and engage a fan situated on top of the turret to filter in breathable oxygen for the crew. While the nuclear protection system came standard, it would only be in 1962 that an anti-radiation lining made up of lead, isobutylene, polyethylene, boron, and beryllium would be included in the tank. The most peculiar modification for the T-55 is the addition of slotted fuel tanks which allow the T-55 to carry not only extra fuel, but also extra ammo. This posed the question of detonation if the tank was hit, but testing revealed that when penetrated by high explosive anti-tank rounds, the fuel only leaked out harmlessly and actually provided crew protection from spalling. The final product would be called the T-55A and was accepted and by decree of the Defense Minister of the USSR, mass production began on May 24th, 1958. And so began the life of a Cold War icon. Production of the T-55 series for the Soviet Army continued until 1967, 
when it was fully replaced by the T-64 and T-64A, but it continued to be built for export clients until 1979, outlasting the T-62, which did not have the same level of export success. Official Soviet documentation states that only 10,600 T-54s were built, while the remaining 50,000 were T-55s. However, this documentation is hard to come by and may be misleading, since spare parts for the early models were manufactured well into the 1980s. 21,000 were built between Poland and the Czech Republic, with records being unavailable from the Kharkiv factories. China reportedly built 10,000 under the license name Type 59. T-54s and 55s were exported to over 60 countries during its 40-year production run and have landed on nearly every continent, including North America if you count exports to Cuba. The vehicle still sees combat to this very day and truly symbolizes the institution principles and values of communism. Equipment first, people second.